grace. 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 Tonight we're talking about spiritual warfare. And what sponsored it, of course, is Vivian's question about poltergeist, which we will touch on on the very end. Uh, spiritual warfare is not neat and clean. It's not, you know, it's only out of ignorance or laziness that we blame all of our hindrances and our problems on the devil. Uh, there's, uh, there's no more than a sidestepping of the real issue in doing that. Uh, we do not long for and pursue intimacy with our God, and that is our greatest enemy. Spiritual apathy is defeat. Spiritual apathy is defeat. It is death. A clear and simple definition for what is spiritual warfare might be helpful here. Spiritual warfare is anything which challenges the advancement of God's rule in our heart. Spiritual warfare is anything which challenges the advancement of God's rule in our heart. Now, you need to hear this. Nothing, and I do mean nothing, challenges the advancement and the rule of God in our hearts more than indifference, more than apathy. This is why our master made much of love. So spiritual warfare is more of an internal issue than an external one. That is a very, 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 very important thing for a Christian to know. It is more of an internal issue than an external one. One of the reasons why many of God's children are ill-equipped for spiritual warfare is because the two greatest parts of our spiritual armor require passion and devotion. And most people are not passionate about God, and they're only devoted to where it hits their comfort zone. Yes? Okay, now, at the beginning, I thought you were saying spiritual warfare like it was a negative thing. No. With the... I misunderstood. No, I'm not saying spiritual warfare is a negative thing. It's a very real thing. What I said is that spiritual warfare is not neat and clean. It doesn't fit into the little box that most of Christendom tries to shove it into. It's only out of our ignorance and our laziness that we wind up blaming most of our problems on the devil in the first place. The devil is really, most of the time, really isn't even our problem. Most people, literally, if we live the New Testament as the New Testament told us to do, the New Covenant as the New Testament outlines it, we would largely live most of our life almost unaware that there even is a devil. The apostles tell us that above all, we are to take the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. But these are not found in the world, but in intimate communion um, between us and our Lord. That's where it's found. So it's not external, it's internal. In fact, if you go to, we're not going to tonight, I didn't feel led to go to that passage, but right now I feel led to at least mention it. You remember what the Bible actually uses, the only place, other place that it mentions the sword of the Spirit is in Hebrews, and it talks about uh, how the, the sword of the Spirit, uh, or the Word of God, is sharp and powerful like any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Nowhere, it might surprise you to find out that the word sword of the Spirit, or the Word of God being like a double-edged sword, Nowhere in scripture is said or spoken in a sentence that uses it like a sword cutting the enemy. The enemy is never even brought up in relation to the sword of the spirit. Never in the same paragraph, much less the same sentence. Take stock in your mind. What do you think probably most people think about when they think about the sword of the spirit in regard to spiritual warfare? They're not thinking about anything to do with themselves. They're thinking about proactive attacking the enemy with a sword. And that's not what the sword of the Spirit is even talking about. Are yeah. you following what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Isn't that the word? God's word it, the word of God the is the sword of the Spirit. That's right. 99% of the time, we're not using the word of God against the devil. We're talking, we're using the word of God to build the image of Jesus Christ in ourselves. Okay, now, so the apostles tell us that above all, take above all, above anything else, Take the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith, but these are not found in the world, but are in intimate communion um, and exchange between us and our Lord. And to borrow a quote from Tozer's prayer, one of Tozer's prayers, the world is too much with us. The world is too much with us. The devil has been behind the advancement of two separate approaches to spiritual warfare, and both of them were designed by him to steer people as far away from the truth and cause internal division in the body of Christ as possible. The devil is not looking to reveal truth. 
He's trying to derail you from truth and polarize the body of Christ on a topic that we should be able to be in agreement about. Divide and conquer, right? Okay. So the first is to walk, the first, uh, the first scheme of the enemy regarding spiritual warfare, what he tells people, what he whispers in Christians' ears, is to walk largely unaware of the devil. Meaning, in other words, just he has, like he plays absolutely no role in the life of a believer. And that's not true. We know the scriptures talk about that we're not ignorant of devices of his devices. We need to uh, stand firm against the wiles of the devil. We're supposed to submit to God, resist the devil. So you're not completely unaware of his existence, are you? Right? Okay? But at the same time, you're not on the other end chasing demons with a sword either. Okay? But the, the, the two polar opposites are, you, the first one is largely to walk unaware of the devil. While there is, in fact, Christians who believe, there are actually Christians today that believe that the time of Evil demons and evil spirits ended with the death of Jesus. They don't believe that they even exist anymore. They've all been dealt with. We don't even see demons anymore. There's a there's actually more Christians who believe that than you might realize. Okay, and that's a complete mistake. Obviously, most of those in this group simply do not recognize the devil and his acti activity in daily life or in society nearly at all. They might from time to time, realize an increase in temptation in their own life as being the work of the enemy or persecution in various parts of the world as resulting from Satan's efforts. But for the most part, the devil and demons are almost entirely irrelevant to their life. Now, there are those who are on the other side that are so focused upon the devil and what they call spiritual warfare against him that they literally believe more in him and his attacks than they do in God's sovereignty and power over their lives. They're so focused on the enemy. These people actually make much of bringing, of being proactive in their spiritual warfare, what they call spiritual warfare. Uh, they believe in storming the gates of hell, you know, which, by the way, is not a phrase that's used anywhere in the entire Bible. Uh, they believe, uh, and they do this largely because of a misunderstanding of the words of our Savior who said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Didn't say that the church will prevail against the, will even attack the gates of hell. It just says the gates of hell will not prevail against us. The Jesus' clear intonation there is that, that though the enemy might try to attack us, he's not going to prevail. It doesn't anywhere in they say that we are going to be attacking the devil. Are you following? Okay. That, that see, do you see how that, that that's a pretty that's a pretty important designation clarification? Wouldn't you agree with me? Now, the word "gates" there, when talking about the gates of, of of Satan or the gates of hell, the word "gates" is almost certainly being used as a metaphor for judgments, because all the way through the Jewish history, which this was Jesus speaking to the Jews in his ministry. Okay, it was in Matthew sixteen. He was talking to Jews, right? And Jews knew that gates were always used symbolically as, not always, I mean, sometimes they would talk about how Samson lifted the gate and pulled it off the city. That was literal. But a lot of times the word gate was being used metaphorically as a place for judgment to take place. Because that's where the elders of, of, of the Jewish nation would sit and pronounce judgments. If people had um, uh, civic civil issues or, or legal issues, they would bring them to the elders. And that was always at the gate of the city where judgments went for. Okay. That's more than likely what God, what Jesus was referring to here. Many, in other words, that we, you know, we have an accuser, and he he pronounces judgments against us through his accusations before the Father, day and night. He accuses us. Now, again, there's a subgroup of Christians that believe, well, yeah, he used to do that, but all that ended when Jesus died and rose from the dead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The Book of Revelation, chapter 12, makes it very clear that that's still going on, and it will end at a certain point in the future. But right now, the accuser of the brethren is still in full bloom doing his accusation work. That's what he does. Okay, so that that the accusations of the enemy, the judgments of the enemy, will not prevail against the church. Well, that sentence makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. Also, you need to understand that um, uh, that uh, Jesus was also in, in the middle of talking about that. The what is it that causes us to overcome the enemy? The Bible is very very clear: is our faith and our confession of the lordship of Jesus Christ. The passage. Matthew chapter 16, 18 was right after Jesus had asked them, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him and said, blessed are you, son of Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but it's been revealed to you by my father, which is in heaven. And upon this rock, 
not talking about Peter, but on the rock of the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I will build my church. Peter even backed up the fact that Jesus is the rock of the church in the book of 2 Peter, which he wrote when he said that there, no, when he talked about Jesus being the firm foundation of the solid rock, the cornerstone of our faith. Okay, so he's taught, that's what he was referring to. He says, and on this revelation of Jesus Christ as Lord and as King and a Savior, I will build my church. And all of the accusations of the enemy will never prevail against it. Well, what is we, what do we learn in, in, um, in 1 John? Uh, I think it is in 1 John. I, I, I should have made a note of that one. I did. I did. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, it says that, uh, that, uh, what, um, this is the victory that causes us to overcome the world, even our faith. And in verse 5, it also says, um, Who are those who overcome the world but those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God? What did Jesus say? On this rock of revelation that I'm the Son of God, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. What did John say? Is the way that we overcome the attacks and the and the 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 the, the accusations thrown at us from the enemy, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'd say that's probably what Jesus was referring to. Are you with me? He's not talking about us taking the battle to the gates of hell. I don't know what the heck we would do that for anyway. Why would we want to knock down the gates of hell? Hell's got nothing in it I want. Hello? So, you know, I've been delivered from that. I'm not going to the gates, okay? That's not what Jesus was referring to. But it's, can you see how by twisting and misunderstanding scriptures, people build an entire doctrine around it? Are you seeing what I'm saying? And that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Those who believe in a, pra a practice or a proactive attack against the enemy in terms of attacking the gates of hell are looking to something more fleshly that's, uh, than simple belief and confession of Jesus' lordship. Oh, I mean, and, and, and that's what the enemy loves to do. He likes to tempt us towards control. One of the reasons why spiritual warfare, as far as attacking the enemy and, and pacing the floor and screaming in tongues and and yelling at the devil and all that stuff gets so much traction in the body of Christ is it makes him you feel like you're doing something. When in fact, Jesus already did everything that needs to be done. Are you following what I'm saying? But see, we like to get the skin in the game because we feel like well, when I see I'm really doing something in the fight. And the funny thing is, if you've ever been in, in meetings like this, and I've been in a ton of them, God forbid, but I've been in a ton of them, you know, it, it, the more... I think that it's obvious by the way that people carry themselves. They believe that the louder they get and the more aggressive their stance, the more intimidated the devil is. Like somehow by me talking louder and screaming at him more and pacing the floor and all that, all of a sudden the devil's in a corner. Oh no, I'm scared of them. Yeah, you're, The tone of your voice is not, not going to intimidate him. I got news for you. He's not scared of you. Not even as a child of God, he's not scared of you because all the defeating he's ever going to experience other than the final one where he's thrown to hell has already happened. You do, all you're doing is not actually defeating him. He's already been defeated in your life. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Now, do you need to maintain what Christ has already given you? Yes. But there's nothing about my actions that are defeating the devil. The devil's already been... De Remember, what did the Bible say that Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil? Did he fail? Or did he succeed? Well, if he's already destroyed the works of the devil, what are my attacks doing? Wearing me out. Wearing me out, maybe. But there's no... And, and again, as we go through this tonight, you're going to see that... that about 98% or more of the things that are usually accompanied with the idea of spiritual warfare not only are not said in the Bible, but you can't find the people of the Bible, Jesus, Paul, um, Barnabas, Silas, James, Peter, any of them ever doing it. That's a big deal. Are you following what I'm saying? I mean, if there are examples, I mean, it, it, surely if there was a, if, if there was a need to, to, um, to, uh, use your, your, your prayer time to throw down demonic spirits out over regions and to, to evoke this and to defeat that and pull down this and pull up that, then you'd at least see one prayer of Paul doing it. One, at least one, wouldn't you think? And, and the Bible says that a doctrine is not established except for two or three witnesses. So you'd expect at least two. And you can't find any. Yes, uh-huh. Peter was a zealot. He was, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, in yeah. Mm -hmm. area. Politically. He was against Rome. Okay. 
the Hellenizing influence of Rome on the Jews. He was against that. Okay. So, good question, by the way. Okay, now, so also, this within this camp is the desire of, of casting down devils from their positions of influence and power on the earth, binding demons, casting them out of regions, placing, um, uh, uh, pacing the floor while quoting, quoting, often misquoting scripture, which is being wielded as a sword against the, the um, perceived devils around them and yielding, yelling in tongues and attempting to make their voices sound threatening. And the whole while, the devil is in a corner laughing his head off at them. Because because he has their devoted attention. Which means Jesus does not. I'm my attention is on the on the enemy, and I'm gonna defeat him with the name of Jesus who's back here somewhere. Their attention's not on him. There what, what what's that example that we saw in the wilderness when the snakes were going among them and by them? He says, you know, don't pay attention to swatting the snakes at your feet, pay attention to the serpent on the pole. And even though the snakes may bite you, you will not die. No, there was no promise that there's not going to be an attack. There's no promise you won't be bitten. The promise is you won't be defeated if you are. Are you seeing what I'm saying? But our attention, what we want to do is turn our attention away from the, uh, the Jesus on the cross, away from Jesus on the throne, and bat at all the demons at our feet. And God's like, well, you know, you know, I already know how that's going to work out for you. Just So you just come to me when you're done beating yourself up. Satan is not intimidated by our misquotes of scripture or our loud voices or threatening his kingdom, nor of our prayers we pray with the aim of destroying his kingdom by our words. What threatens Satan is a life of passionate devotion lived towards God. That safeguards the child of God against his advances in their life, and it makes them salt and light to the world around them. That threatens him. And none of that requires them to even talk to him. Hello? Now, we have covered this topic of binding and loosening before, which is why I'm not going to even bother tonight. We've got a whole article on it on the website. If you don't remember what we covered in that, go back and read it, and you'll know everything we've taught about it. It's a very clear teaching. It's not hard at all. Read it. It's in the article section on the website. So I'm not even covering that tonight. Uh, what we are looking at tonight is what the New Testament actually says about our enemy and when and how we are to deal with him. It might surprise you to realize how little the New Testament actually speaks about the devil, demons, or evil spirits. Furthermore, it might surprise you what it says and what it does not say. You will find that the battle is not directed at the enemy, and most of our interactions with him are in the form of resisting his attacks, not taking a battle against him. And you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to the words as we're reading them, okay? Because what matters is what was written, not what Mark tells you, okay? Ephesians, and now, and one of the reasons why this is true is because of what the Bible tells us is our unique condition now that we are born again. Uh, Ephesians 5, 8 says, once, once, at one time, you were, you didn't just have it, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. Right? Uh, Colossians 1, 13 through 23 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. What has He done? He's delivered me from the power and the kingdom of darkness and conveyed me, translated me, moved me into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Get a visual picture of yourself of two models on a table. One is the kingdom of darkness, and the other one is this glorious kingdom of God with this high wall around it. And you are this little stick figure, and he, God picked you out of this one over here on the left, and he planted you in the middle of this huge kingdom of his with this huge wall around it. At this point, how concerned is this stick figure of this thing over here? Nothing. I'm, I've got a wall of the kingdom of God around me between me and it. And not only that, my association has been severed from it. Its ability to affect me, now, unless I let it, unless I let it, its ability to conquer me or affect me has been removed from me as long as I maintain my active faith and trust in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It can't touch me. He has no power over me. That has been ended once I died and rose with Christ. 
I was dark. I, I didn't just have darkness attacking me back then. I was in unity with darkness. I was darkness, but now I am light. I got news for you. The devil would be more concerned of you going over there than you ever ought to be of him coming over here. Your light in the, what overcomes darkness but light, and you are light in the Lord. The darkness has been removed from me. I'm no longer. I mean, any association I have with him is forever severed. I have no relationship with the devil anymore. The Bible has destroyed him who had the power of death, who who all of our lives were held captive because of the fear of death. God has destroyed it. So why is there fear? Why is there a need to try to fight a battle that's already been fought and won? Hello? Let's keep on reading. He says, I'll uh, read verse 13 again. It says, he has delivered us, has, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness. In no, power of darkness, no more sway over Mark. I'm delivered from that, right? And not only that, but he's conveyed me into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and we have the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, or preeminent over all creation. For by him all things were created that are both in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. He's over all of them. Whether the good ones or the bad ones, he's over them all. Right? Right? All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Jesus all of the fullness of the Godhood should dwell in bodily form. And by him he reconciled all things back to himself. By Jesus the Father reconciled all things back to himself. By him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having, 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 past tense, made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed, if indeed, you continue in the faith. That's the root right there, isn't it? The, the, the gates of hell can't prevail against is that faith in the Son of God. That's the thing that caused me to overcome is my ongoing trust in the Son of God. Amen? He says, If indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. You know, I, I really believe that those people that are very, very caught up in what they call spiritual warfare have forgotten about a hope. They're so aware of what they perceive as attacks and perceived threats that they don't remember that they're inside of a kingdom that's given them hope. The death has been removed from them. They've been, been delivered and they can been conveyed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. They have forgotten some things. Are you following what I'm saying? I think that that's very, very, very important. He says, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Now, Evil spirits in the New Testament, and I'm talking about, I use the New King James Version, just so you know. The word evil spirits appear three times in the New Testament. The word evil spirits. It's in Acts 5.3, where Simon, the one guy who tried to buy the Holy Spirit, remember that? Was taught, it was spoken about. When the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out demons, right? Evil spirits in the name of Jesus, and it didn't work well for them. And then in Acts 26, verse 18, Paul recounting his, conver um, his conversion and Jesus telling him about his ministry, which would include turning people away from the power of Satan into the power of God. Three times. Okay? Demons are mentioned about nine times. Now, when I say nine, I'm talking about nine times where an example is mentioned. That example might appear in three of the four Gospels. But that, to me, doesn't account for three examples. It counts as one, okay? So, nine times. And those are all in the ministry of Jesus Christ. There's one time in the book of Acts, verse 16, verse 16 through 8, uh, chapter 16, verse 16 through 18, where a spirit of divination, div divination is mentioned, and we'll deal with that later. 
And then Satan and or the devil are mentioned the most, and that's 23 times, I mean 32 times. And I did not include times when Jesus was talking about children of the devil, because it's not talking about the devil, it's talking about children of the devil. So I didn't include that. Nor did I did I include the time when he turned around to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, because you are an offense to me, because he was talking to Peter at the time. Now, Peter was speaking on behalf of the devil, but he wasn't talking to the devil, okay? So I excluded that as well. Now, so approximately nine times in Jesus' ministry, you see um, one, uh, one time in a parable, one time referring to hell prepared for the devil and his angels, and one time taking up uh, talking about how he takes up the seed that was sown in the human heart, the devil's mentioned, okay? Two times in the book of Acts, when uh, uh, once in reference to Jesus' ministry, when it says he went about doing good and healing all who were possessed or oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And once when Paul had to deal with the demonic spirit, He's actually, now again, I'm talking about different words. He did, he dealt with a spirit of divination and then he dealt with a, a devil. He only cast one out ever that we know of in scripture, Paul. One. Not hundreds, not thousands, not two. One. One. Okay. Does that mean that it's not relevant today? Of course it is. I'm just saying, can you see how taking one example and then turning it into all you see is, that might be a problem. You know what I mean? Okay? We're, we're, I want you to be super clear. I'm not playing down the role of the enemy in our life. The Bible tells us we are not to be ignorant of him. The Bible does not, I'm not trying to say that he is not a, um, a uh, that he could not be a genuine and real threat in our life if we believe his deceptions. Certainly. If this came down to a fist fight, so to speak, between me and the devil without the help of Jesus, I would have no help at all. I would I would be defeated hands down. The devil is stronger than human beings in their current state. But I'm not, and neither you, alone. I'm with God. Therefore, the devil is much weaker than God and I. Because it's never just the devil and Mark. <laughs> Are you following me? Now, if I ever let that be the case, well, then the gig's up. Mark's already lost before it started. Amen? But I'm not going into this alone. But so are you, so you, are you understand what I'm saying? I'm not playing down that the enemy does have the ability through deception to get us to buy his lies. And by that, he can remove from us our, at least temporarily, our faith, our reliance upon the Lordship of Jesus Christ in an area of our life and therefore defeat us. Right? I'm not saying it's not a real possibility. I'm not saying, because every time we sin in one way or another, we're giving into at least the influence of sin, if not the direct influence of a demonic spirit. Okay? So I'm not playing down it. What I am trying to do is bring clarity to it and a balance to it in comparison to what the scriptures actually say. That is important. Okay? Romans chapter 16 verse 20 talks about how God will crush Satan shortly under our feet. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 talk about delivering certain people in the body of Christ who have gone on an unrepentant sin and have been uh, confronted about it three times, even being brought before the church to deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Okay, that's another time the word Satan is brought up. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 5 talks about um, if you have separated yourself inside of marriage uh, from intercourse with your mate due to a time of fasting and prayer, then you're supposed to come together quickly and have intercourse again lest you lay prey to the temptation of the enemy because we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. That's the time the devil's brought up, okay? Um, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Forgive, and so Satan does not take advantage of us because we're not ignorant of his tactics. So st Satan's brought up, but not as something we attack, but you forgive those who are doing something wrong against you so you don't open a door for the enemy, right? But what would I have to do for the enemy to be able to do anything? I've got to open a door. Because otherwise it stays close to him. One of the ways I can do that is walking in unforgiveness. Not you know, having sticky fingers and sticky emotions where you just can't let go of something. That's a problem. Now you've just invited the enemy in. See what I'm saying? That's dangerous stuff. For 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14. Satan presents himself sometimes as an angel of light. It's mentioned there. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. How, so far, how many times have we seen anything about us attacking the devil? No, we're halfway through the New Testament. 
Okay, Second Corinthians twelve seven. Uh, the Bible talked about. Uh, Paul said that um, that he was taken up in the third heaven to receive revelations, um, and and that um, messengers from Satan had come to buffet him, lest he be exalted above measure. So that's another time his name is brought up. In Ephesians four twenty six, we are encouraged to give no place to the devil. Doesn't say go run after him, attack him, and pull down the gates of hell. Just says don't give him any place. But no, deliberately don't give him place. Because in other words, this is talking about when he's coming against you and trying to get you to lower your guard, don't do it. Okay? Stand firm. This is still, though, the enemy coming against me and my response to that, not me going to attack him. Are you seeing that in the verse? Okay. Just want to make sure you're seeing it. Ephesians 6, 11. We are to stand against the methods and the schemes of the devil with our armor on. Again, even when he brings up all the armor, not one time does he say, attack the devil. He says three or four times, he does say, stand firm. Don't let his attack against you move you. But it doesn't say turn around and attack him. Okay, and we're going to read that passage in a little while, but I'm just giving you the references in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Satan hindered Paul from coming to the people of Thessalonica. He said, time and again, I tried to come to you, but the devil hindered us. That's all it said. It doesn't say, now because the devil hindered us, we got into a group and we bound him and we cast him out and we did this and we did that and that, and that no good so-and-so wasn't able to do it the next time, I tell you that. It doesn't say that. It says, time and again, the enemy hindered us from getting there. That's all it says. To read into it is to do just that. Read into it. And we don't want to do that. Paul didn't say what he did in reply to that. We do know that it did actually work. It hindered him. He was not able to make it a few times. <laughs> Right? But the letter got there. Right? You see what I'm saying? Okay. Second Thessalonians 2 9, describing the coming of the Antichrist, that it would be according to the working of Satan. Okay, that's another place it's brought up. First Timothy 1 20. Um, uh, bring, uh, um, Paul talks about how he turned over Hermenius and Alexander to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's an example of it. Okay, so Satan's brought up there. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, it tells him, don't you let young men become pastors because otherwise they will fall into the trap of the devil who was lifted up because of pride. Okay, so that's another place the devil is being brought up. Um, 1 Timothy 5, 15, some have already turned aside to Satan. Well, and that was true. First, in 1 Timothy 5, 15, Paul was giving a salutation and he's telling them that they need to do certain things that regarded their connection with the Lord because some have already turned aside to Satan. It doesn't say Satan came in and overpowered them. It doesn't say that they had no help and it was they were powerless to do anything about it. It didn't say well because they didn't attack the devil the right way. It just says that they decided of their own will to go and follow Satan again. Okay? All right. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 through 26. This is what I'm going to actually read because it has something to it. It says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they do generate strife. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps... God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So notice what has to happen for this person to be set free from the captivity of the enemy. Truth has got to get to them and God's got to grant them a change of heart. Does it say anything about, now you guys, make sure that you get into a big prayer circle and you do this and you do that and you come against the devil and you bind them and you do this. It doesn't say that. It just says here, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and in humility correct those who are in opposition. So if you see someone who's being taken captive by Satan to do his will, you go to them by the Spirit of the Lord and correct them. Tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And with that information seasoned with grace in their heart, God may, didn't say he will, he might grant them a change of heart so they can come to their senses and escape the snare of the enemy that they have been taken captive into. They escape themselves. Not me as a brother escape for them because I charged the battle, you know, the battlement of the devil with my sword blazing high. I didn't say anything about that. Just says, I go to them, speak to the truth to them, and then peradventure God will grant them a change of heart so they can escape. That's all it says. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus became like us in order to destroy the devil who had the power of death. So that's another time the devil's brought up. James 4, 7. We're getting towards the end of the New Testament, guys. Haven't found anything about attacking him yet. James 4, 7 tells us to submit to God and resist the devil. Okay? 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us to be sober and vigilant because the devil is looking to devour whoever he can. Again, that's the devil coming against you, not you against him. Uh, 1 John 3, 8 and 10 talks about the children of the devil. But it doesn't say anything much, you know, doesn't say anything about him, just talking about his children. Jude 1, 9 talks about how Michael didn't even rebuke the devil, but said the Lord rebuke you. Okay? Revelation, now in the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. Revelation 2.10, the devil is going to, uh, going to put some of you into prison. Jesus talking in his letters to the churches. He says, some of you are going to be placed in, uh, the devil is going to place some of you in prison. Now make sure you bind him so he can't do that. No, it didn't say that. Now make, make sure that you just yell real loud and he'll be intimidated. That won't happen. No, it didn't say that. It didn't say pace the floor screaming in tongues and he won't be able to put your, it doesn't say anything about it. He just said, I'm telling you, it's going to happen didn't say pray against it. I'm just letting you know it's going to happen. Right? Okay? Um, uh, uh, Revelation, he does, uh, in the, in the, to the churches, he brings up the devil a few times. One time he says, um, he talks about how I know where you are, that you are near the, the seat or the throne of Satan, meaning where you are in that part of the world where Satan really has a lot of authority. I know where you are. Um, he also talks about how, you know, um, I know how you hate the works of these people who talk about the depths of Satan um, as if that were really a thing and uh, and you've kept yourself pure. So the devil's brought up a few times, but never, never in this in the in the um, in the the context of attacking him or praying against him or doing anything against him at all. OK, and again, don't take my word for it. Just read chapter three and ch- chapter two and chapter three in Revelation. You'll see everything that Jesus said to the churches and the times two or three times Satan's brought up and none of them talk about turning around and attacking him. Not once. But please don't take my word for it. Do yourself a favor. Just read the two chapters. It won't hurt you. OK, Revelation chapter 12, verse nine talks about it talks about the initial fall of Satan, how he's cast out of heaven and how his tail reached up and threw a third of the angels of heaven down with him. Okay, talks about that, but doesn't say anything about our interactions with him, just talks about the devil. Okay, his initial fall. Um, uh, Revelation 12, 12, 12, 12 talks about he has great wrath because he knows that his time is running out. Uh, chapter 20, verse 2 talks about how a great angel binds the devil. That's the only time that we ever see that word ever used, but it's with a literal chain and thrown into the abyss for a thousand years. An angel does that, not you and I, an angel does it. Okay. Then it last time it's brought up is in Revela- uh, Revelation 20, verse 10. It says um, that when he's talks about how he's cast into hell. Now, reference is made about how the devil was let loose from the thousand year imprisonment so that he might go out and deceive the nations. But you'll notice both times it's brought up about him being bound and cast into the abyss and then his release from the abyss, both of them were directly attached to his going out and doing the work of deceiving. That's what he does. Doesn't say he does any work of overpowering because he doesn't have the ability to overpower. Do you realize the devil can't, of his own will, overpower even a non-believer? A non-believer has got to succumb to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even as their father, he has no authority to make something happen that they don't let happen. And all the devils in the world cannot keep a single child of the devil from confessing the lordship of Jesus Christ and becoming his child. Right? If the devil had power over non-believers, that's when he would express it and keeping them from being able to become a child of God. And he can't do it. He's powerless. Right? Okay. Now, do you know how many times Jesus, Paul, or any of those who worked with him ever bound the devil? Zero. Jesus used an example when he was talking about a strong man and the demonic spirit and the person whose house was being plundered. And he talked about binding the strong man. And it is extremely likely that the strong one is not talking about the devil, but talking about the person, the owner of the home, that the enemy has got to first bind the strong man, bind the person who owns the house so we can plunder his goods. God, Jesus was not telling you and I how to bind Satan so we can plunder his goods. He's got nothing I want. 
Okay, you see what I'm saying? But even if he was talking about that, which he wasn't, but even if he was, that's the only place you see him even talking about. You never see him doing it. Never one time did Jesus ever say, Satan, I bind you, or demonic spirit, I bind you. Sometimes all he ever said was just, go. That's it. One word. Go. Other times he had a little bit of a conversation with them, but not much. But never one time do you ever hear him binding them. Okay, that's important. All right. Do you know how many times Paul cast a demon out of a person? The, written in scripture. I'm sure it happened more than this, but how many times? One time in the entire New Testament. Once. One time. Would, would that have been your guess? And to be honest with you, it wouldn't have been my guess. Would it have been your default guess that only one time do you ever see Paul casting out a demonic spirit? That was not, that would not have been my guess, I have to tell you. I would have been thinking, thinking it probably happened quite a bit, but it actually did not. Go back and read through the book of Acts. You won't find it but one time. Now, and I'm going to read to you that, that case right now, and that's actually the spirit of divination that we mentioned earlier. It's in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. It says, Now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. So she was possessed, wasn't she? By spirit of divination. Um, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Well, that was true, right? And she did this for many days. So it wasn't as soon as Paul saw her, he just cast the demon out. He let her just do her thing for many days before he finally got annoyed enough to do something. This is the only time he ever cast anything out that we ever see. Okay? It says, And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to her, to the spirit, not to the girl, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. He didn't say, Now I bind you, and I render you ineffective, and I do this, and I take the sword of the spirit, and I say this, and I'm going to march and scream in tongues for an hour, and you get out of her. No, he just said, Come out in the name of Jesus. And that was it. It was over. That's the sole example. And it doesn't even say it happened to me. It says that she came, he came out of her that very hour. That's the last part of the verse. That's all that's said. The only time Paul ever casts a demon out of anyone that's recorded in the scripture, that's it. Right there. Now, do I believe that he probably cast out a lot of demons in his ministry? Probably. He was an apostle. He was going into unevangelized areas. So most people, when he first got there, weren't born again. So did he probably run to a lot of demons? Yes. But So what does that mean that it's not mentioned? Then it must not be that important. Hello? Not saying that the devil's not real. It's not saying that we don't have authority over demonic spirits to cast them out of the lost in certain situations. In certain situations, you really don't have an authority to. If that if that person wants them there, and now the only thing that probably gave the, um, Paul the ability to cast this demonic spirit out of this girl was because of the fact that she was badgering him and speaking words over their ministry for many days. If she had left him alone, it had only been a day or two, he would have just left her alone because she clearly wanted that spirit there. Okay. The only thing that gave him authority was the fact that it was continual badgering. The devil was the one that over-intervened, overstretched his reach into Paul's life. And so finally he said, enough, I'm done. Right? But does the enemy have the right to badger you and give you a hard time? Yes. Which is why he let it go on for many days. But eventually he's like, you know what? I'm done with this. And then he cast the dumb spirit out. That also tells me, though the words don't actually say it, I, this is Mark's opinion, I'll own that. He probably didn't have authority to do it the first day because the girl wanted it. Hello, are you following me? It, it would be just like me if I saw a guy walking down the street and he had a gun. You know, I, I don't know if he's got the, the a permit or a right to carry or whatever. You know, I don't necessarily have the right to do anything about that, especially if it's like hanging up in the back of his truck or something like that, you know. But if that same guy follows me for many days and he's got that rifle in the back, you bet Mark's going to do something about that. But if he just passes me on the highway, I'm probably not going to do a thing about it because he, I don't know, and I don't have the authority to pull him over and ask what's in his glove compartment to see his, 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 um, uh, if he has a permit to carry or not. Okay, so I'm not going to, it's not even in my jurisdiction or my authority. 
But if he starts following me or my family member for many days and has that rifle you can see in the back window, you guarantee all of a sudden I've got authority to do something. Are you seeing what I'm saying? I think that's tantamount to what was happening there with Paul. Okay? And I admit that's my opinion because it doesn't give us any other details. That's all it tells us. But it does make a point to make sure we understand this happened for a lot of days before Jesus and before Paul did something about it. So I infer from that, something that I'm not going to be dogmatic about, but I infer from that he probably didn't have authority until it reached a certain point. Does that make sense to you? Again, am I telling you that's doctrine? No, I am not. That's Mark's opinion, but that's where I come up with my opinion. So there you have it, okay? It's worth about that much. Um, next one I'm going to read you is in Luke chapter 4. This one is uh, one that uh, that you're very familiar with. And it's uh, the one where... Uh, so it says, Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit, the Spirit into the wilderness, being, te being tempt for, tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when, he had, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Uh, and Jesus, uh, Jesus answered and said to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. Okay, he, he didn't say, now I bind you, you get away from me. I, I know I'm making a lot of that, but I want to make sure, I want to apply this so you can see where it's missing. This would be a great place to do that, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, if we really had that in an arsenal, that'd be a great place to do it, you'd think, you know? But all he did was just reply with the word of God and keep walking, right? Was he concerned if the enemy was going to come back and tempt him? No, the enemy's got a right to tempt you. No, no, nowhere in the Bible does it say you've got authority to make the enemy leave you and he can never come back. Even in an area of your life, there is no, there is no such promise in the Bible. Yes, uh-huh. That seems good. He's talking to Peter. Says, get, get thee behind me, Satan, because you are an offense to me, because you are mindful of the things of the devil or the things of the world and not the things of God. And he did that because Peter, right after he said you are the son, the, the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus at that point, once they had that revelation down, began from that day forward to tell them how the son of man must suffer and um, a crucifixion and die. And Peter pulled him aside and rebuked him and said, you will never die. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, because you are an offense for me, to me, because you are more mindful of the things of man than the things of God. But he said it to Peter. Okay, because the devil was expressing his opinion through Peter. Okay, so that good question, but does that answer you? Yes. He may have been talking to Satan, but it really wasn't an issue. It, the issue was really Peter. Because the devil, if he wanted to try to tempt Jesus not to die, he would have said it directly to Jesus himself, not through one of his disciples. Jesus never took marching orders from his disciples, so that would have been a bad tactic of the enemy anyway. This was probably just Peter feeling inspired to do what seemed good. Jesus, you can never die. You're Messiah. <laughs> Sounds good. I mean, the doesn't that sound good? You know what I mean? If I had been Peter, I probably would have fallen for that too, you know? Sounds like a good religious right thing to say. And more than likely, Jesus was teaching Peter by saying this, by saying, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not listening to you. And the reason why you ever believe that in the first uh, reason, uh, uh, first place, Peter, is because you're being more mindful of the ways of man than the ways of God. Why would he tell that to the de devil? That he already, I mean, the devil already knows he's not mindful of the ways of God. And that's not going to change. He was probably talking to Peter, more than likely. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, can I say absolutely he wasn't talking to the devil? No, not categorically, but probably not. He was probably talking to Peter, okay? Uh, in that, he was trying to make it clear to Peter where this thought originated. It wasn't God. And the only reason it gained traction is because you're already more mindful of the ways of man than the ways of God. Or that would have never gotten off the ground and you would have never said it to me, right? It was teaching, which is what Jesus did. He taught, right? So anyway, it says, therefore, if you will worship me before or before me, um, I'm sorry, then the devil took him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said to him, all of this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered into me and I, uh, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. For this, not this time he did say, get behind me, Satan, to Satan. He says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So Jesus was pointing back to what he must do. I can't worship you because the scripture says I can only worship God. And you ain't him, right? 
Okay. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him in the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written. Right. Now, th th this right here is um, the first time that the devil caught on. Jesus isn't going to be moved. It's not the Bible. So I learned a lot from that. The, the devil doesn't know everything. If he'd known everything, the first temptation would have been from Scripture. He didn't learn that until the third time he came to Jesus. He's like, okay, he's not buying anything but Scripture. I'll come to him with Scripture. And does the devil know Scripture? You bet he does. Better than the best theologian on this planet, he knows the Bible. Okay? And he could twist it better than the best of them. Okay? So the third time he tries to tempt Jesus by misapplying Scripture, which he's very good at misapplying scripture and the, what and of course jesus answers him with with scripture again he says it has been said you shall not tempt the lord your god now when the devil had ended his temptation he departed from him until a more opportune time nowhere in there do we have jesus attacking the enemy every time he's just counter sparring what the enemy does and attack against him what about Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 6? It says, Now, when they had gone through the Isle of pa uh, um, Paphos, they, uh, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who, uh, uh, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man uh, called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But, uh, but Elamus, the sorcerer, for so was his name as it is translated, with, um, um, withstood them, seeking uh, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, "Get out of him, Satan!" No, he didn't say that. He said, "O oh, oh, fool of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting?" the straight paths of the Lord. And now indeed, the hand of the Lord was up, is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun, for a period of time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He didn't cast the demon out. He left it there, because the guy wanted the demon there. Right? Okay, but what did he do? Because he was encroaching the work of the Lord, he and, and I guarantee Paul was led by this. He didn't just come up with something he wanted to do because God is not in any way obligated to back the words of Paul any more than he's obligated to back the words of Mark, right? More than likely, the Spirit of God told him what to say to this man, and he said, therefore, the, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you're going to go around essentially blind, not being even able to see the sun for many days. And when it happened, the very proconsul that Paul had been trying to witness to, now they believed. Because at this point, they weren't sure whether Paul was right or this sorcerer guy was right, right? Well, the fact that the sorcerer was made blind by the god of Paul, they thought, ah, I bet Paul's probably bad. He's probably the right one. We'll listen to him, right? That's what happened. But again, great opportunity to do some binding, don't you think? Not mentioned. Ephesians chapter 4. Looking at verse 25 through 28, it says, Therefore, put away lying, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Give. It says, don't let, doesn't say don't let him take, it says don't give it to him. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to who is, him who is in need. Notice how much time he spends lingering about the devil. It's something just He just says in passing. He says, and don't give any place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. It just goes on, as if he didn't even bring him up. That's how much of a threat he is. That's how much we need to pay attention to him. Now, what are some of his tactics? Because the Bible talks about his tactics a handful of times. What are some of his tactics? Well, Luke chapter 8, verse 12 mentions one of them. And that's in the parable that Jesus talks about, the, sow, the seed being sowed in the heart. It says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. But I want you to notice, remember how many hearts were there? Say it. There were four, Right? I'm sorry. In in this parable of the of the, of the hearts of the sower and the, the sower and the seed, 
There are four hearts, right? How many of them does it talk about the devil wanting to, the devil taking or stealing the word of God from their heart? One. And that's one on the wayside. The one that's barely paying attention, the enemy seeks to steal the word of God that was sown in their heart. Which they're not hard to do with anyway because they're hardly paying attention in the first place. All the other word people heard the word of God and did at least something with it. Okay? The person, the person that sprouted up immediately but had no root in themselves, it says they immediately they received the word with gladness. But afterwards, when persecutions came because of the word, then they stumbled. The devil didn't take the word of God from them. He challenged the word in them. Right? What about the uh, the third heart? It says, then you got the other people who hear the word of God and it begins to grow and, and, and so on. But the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things other than God came in and choked out the word. So don't say the devil did that. They did that by where they directed their attentions. Only one person was he really a threat to. And that was a person that was on the wayside hardly paying attention in the first place. I'm not, you know, do you think I'm adding to the Word of God in what I'm saying here or no? And again, go back and read. There's at least two places, Luke and in Mark chapter 4, at least two. I don't remember the Mark, uh, whether uh, Matthew brings up this passage or not, but at least Luke and Mark bring up this passage. Go back and read it in both places and see whether I'm right. All right? But are you seeing, are you seeing a pattern here so far? with how we deal with him. Okay, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 34. Simon, Simon, pay, pay attention. Satan has demanded to have you all to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed against the devil. No, I prayed to God for you, Simon, that your faith would not fail. If his faith would not fail, then all these threats to the enemy aren't going to do anything anyway. But the enemy has desired you and has requested God the Father for you that he might sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. He didn't say, I went to spiritual warfare for you and beat that devil up good. He won't bother you again. That would have been a great time to bring that up, you think? But no, he said, I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail you. That's what I did. Amen? Okay? Let's go on to John chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. It says, Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come to depart from this world to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now loved them to the very, very end. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The evening meal was in progression, and the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. So, does the enemy have access to your heart? Yeah, of course he does. He, and, and if you're listening to, you, to him, he'll actually place things into your heart. He, I mean, even Jesus heard the words of, Je, of, of Satan, didn't he? That's how he replied to him when he was being tempted for those, uh, after the 40 days of fasting, right? He heard the words of the enemy, but the devil, what did Jesus say towards the end of his ministry? He says, the, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has found no place in me. He's trying to plant seeds, but the garden's full. There's no place else to put a seed. Amen? Whereas that third heart, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things, were growing up along with the word of God, and they choked it out. But in Jesus' heart, there was no room for anything but the word. Right? He's found no place in me. But he knew there was a possibility with Peter, so he prayed for Peter. Didn't pray against the devil. He prayed for Peter, that his faith wouldn't fail him. Right? So, but with Judas, he had already made up his mind what he was going to do. And we knew from, and God knew, Jesus knew from the beginning of his ministry that G Judas was going to choose to betray him. It wasn't that Judas had no choice. Of course he had a choice. Uh, God did not predestine one human being that he had to deny God. God's not like that. God's will is that every man come to know him. Amen? And, and Judas, more than most people who have ever walked on this planet, had a prime opportunity to believe in Jesus, would you not say? He walked and lived with the man for three years. And yet he still had it in him to betray him because money was more important than Jesus was. Right? Okay? But what did it say? He says, it says, the devil had already put into the heart of Jesus, Simon's son, that he should betray Jesus. That he should. 
Not that he has to, because the devil couldn't make um, Judas Iscariot do anything. He placed it in his heart as a suggestion, that's something you should do. And Judas did it. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Now a man named Ananias, together with Sapphira, his wife, sold a piece of property and kept back for himself part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge, and he brought only part of it and placed it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds from the sale of the land? Not that there would be anything wrong with him keeping part of it, but he was being presented as though I'm giving you all. He was lying. And who put it in his heart to do that? The devil. This was a child of God for all we know. I mean, I mean, it sounds like this man was born again, Ananias and Sapphira. They were part of the church. If they weren't part of the church, why would it be in their heart to sell their land and give any of it? You know what I mean? But the devil had placed it in their heart to do this, right? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Well, the root of that was, again, money. So far, money's a, a problem, right? It's what... It's what opened the door in Judas's heart. It's what opened the door in Ananias and Sapphira's heart. And it's one of the three things that were brought up in the third heart in Jesus' parable of the sower and the word. Right? Money, money, money. There's a problem with this money thing, don't you think? I'm seeing a pattern here. I mean, I'm not the, I'm not the sharpest tool in the, in the shed, but I mean, I pick up on that, right? Okay, now, so what are we to do? So these are just some of the schemes of the enemy. I just went through what the New Testament brings up as some of the schemes of the enemy. What should we do? What are we told to do against the enemy with these things? Well, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 says, Finally, be, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. So already my attention's on God and on his ability, not mine. I, didn't, I haven't even gotten off the runway yet, and this is not about Mark or Mark's power, Mark's authority, Mark doing anything, you are surrendering to a strength that's greater than you. You have a source and it's not you, right? It says, clothe yourself with the full armor of God. Even the armor belongs to dad, right? Okay? Clothe yourself with the full armor of God so that you will be able to run slap over the enemy. No, no, no. So that you might be able to stand against him. Again, I'm seeing a pattern. So that you may be able to stand against the schemes or the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, against uh, world rulers of this darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Now, it's right from there that we get, that people get the idea, okay, if that's where the enemy is, that's where I need to take the battle. But, this is the only place, other than maybe one other two, one or two other places where those rulers are mentioned. This is the only time it's made in reference, talked about in reference to our armor and any response that we give to the devil. And never one time does it say anything about attacking the enemy. So that's very, again, we learn as much by what the Bible doesn't say than by what it does say, right? So we learn a lot here. We've only read two verses so far, and we've learned a lot. We are to turn our attention to the source of our strength, who is God, and we are not to turn our attention towards the devil. So that's the first thing we learn. Notice also Paul does not say, talk about our warfare or our battle or even our attack is against the devil, but rather our struggle is against him. Our struggle. Also, this does not say that we are taking the fight to him, but rather that we are standing against his attack which is also reinforced in, reinforced in the very next verse, verse 16, uh, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, with that stand has to do with an attack against me, doesn't it? Yes or no? Right? Okay. In the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Well, I'm getting a totally different picture here than the proactive thing. And, and this right here, this whole thing about withstand and stand, completely agrees with something that Paul said to the Corinthian church when he said that no trial has overtaken you that, that is not faced by everyone else. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear, but with the trial will also provide a, a way out so that you may endure it or stand up under it. 
All of that is talking about attack coming against me and how I take my stand and it doesn't win. Does not talk about me attacking the enemy. Right? Keeping going and keep on going in Ephesians 6, picking up in verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. And above everything else, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts that the wicked one is throwing at you. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word, praying. Now you need to understand, in the Greek, it literally says it that way. That I take the word of God in prayer. I don't take the word of God as a sword and go slice the enemy. I go to the word of God and take the word of God and bring it before my father. It doesn't say in prayer, pray against the enemy. What does it say? It says praying with all prayer and supplication, the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for your brothers and sisters in the faith. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters in the faith. I'm not praying against the devil. Any more than when the devil asked for Peter, did Jesus say, I prayed against the devil for you? No, he didn't say that. I prayed that your faith would stand strong in the middle of the attack. Right? He was praying for the same. Exactly what we're told to do right here. He says, and for me, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am also an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's what deals with the, the armor of God. What, what is this whole armor thing? He says, um, your waist skirt about with truth. Now, you guys, I've told you this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but back then, messengers, which they had a lot of messengers because they didn't have telephones, um, they would, uh, they didn't, neither did they have pants or slacks back then. Everybody wore the equivalent of what looked like a robe or a skirt. Men, women, everybody, because that's all they had, right? There was no tailored clothes that made legs uh, around, uh, around your legs, okay? Messengers, it was, they found it kind of difficult to run in skirts, okay? So what they would do is they would take it, uh, their skirt, and they would fold it over and then up in the middle. It would literally look like a diaper, an old cloth diaper. And they didn't have a safety pin, so they would take a belt and they tie it around in the middle, and it would free their legs to run. And that was the imagery he's using here. What frees you is truth. Having your loins girt about with truth. What did Jesus say? And you will know the truth, and it shall set you free. That's what it's being used for. Okay? And, and and most of the time that we were reading in the book of Acts and other places like that, what was really, really necessary is that even the even person that was taken captive by the devil to do his will, what was it we were supposed to do? We were supposed to go to them and speak the truth to them so that God, peradventure, might grant them a change of heart. Truth. Right? So it, it has the ability to free. Right? Okay. What's the next thing? The breastplate of righteousness. In other words, the thing that protects me is my right standing with God. I have been made right with him. How many of you have recognized that really literally as a protection in your life in some time or another where you felt protected because you know I'm right with God? Not because of anything I did, but I know I'm surrounded in righteousness because of whose I am. Doesn't that just make you feel wrapped up? It makes you feel safe. Well, you know, a breastplate covers all the vital organs, doesn't it? You know, what protects all the vital parts of me? My right standing with God. Amen? Again, nothing to do with attack, but it sure does protect you. And having your feet shod with going forth with that truth that's freed your feet so that you're not tripping, right? To go share the gospel of reconciliation with God with others. That's what I shod my feet with. What the Bible talks about is how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings of good news, right? Who preach the gospel. So have your feet shod with that. And then above everything else, take the shield of faith with which I'm going to quench everything the enemy tries to throw against me. Not a shield that I beat him over the head with, but one that I, I quench all the enemy, the darts that he throws at me. 
It's my faith that makes every accusation he throws at me meaningless. Right? Well, Mark, I know what you did. I know that thought you had. That's not like God. You are condemned. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not condemned. By the way, you're not wrong. I did something wrong. And I brought it before the Father, and I'm forgiven, and I've got righteousness and a shield, and you can talk at me all day long, but I don't believe you. I'm bellied up to the table in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy are sh chasing me all the days of my life. You are behind me. I'm not concerned with anything you're saying. Talk on. I have no need to bind him. I have no need to make him shut up. I have no need to duct tape his mouth, though I would love to. There is no provision for that in Scripture. But what I have is faith that makes all of his accusations meaningless. Right? What is it that causes us to overcome the world? Our faith. Amen? So far, so far, not an offensive weapon yet, right? And also, take with you the helmet covers this part of you of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. And what you do with that sword, with the words of the Word, or the word of God, you pray always with all manner of prayer, right? And what does he pray for? He says, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all of the saints. And also, don't forget me. Pray for me that utterance might be given to me and that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, that my feet might be shot with the preparation of the gospel peace and go out and preach the gospel, right? That's what you pray. Now, once does it say use your armor to pray against the devil? What about James? Chapter 4 tells us what to do. Well, in chapter 4, verse 4 says, Adulterers, do you not know that your friendship with the world means hostility towards God? So whoever decides to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Or do you know that the, do you not think that the scripture uh, so do you think the scripture means nothing when it says that the spirit that that God caused to dwell within us has an envious yearning for you? But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will run away from you. It doesn't say he's going to stay away forever. It just says that in these incursions, you submit to God, dig your feet in, you stand where you are, and resist his influence. And what's going to happen after he gets tired enough? Just like it happened with Jesus. He left him for a more appropriate time, a more convenient time. He is coming back, I promise. But he's going to leave you for a more convenient time because this is clearly not it. They're standing, and they're not giving in. Just like Jesus did. How many times did that take? Well, from the example we have in Matthew and in Luke and stuff like that, uh, clearly the devil came to Jesus with three separate temptations, and it was so firm that after the third one, he's like, I'm done. I'll come back another day. Right? Well, he might, for you and me, we may not be nearly as firm as Jesus. It might make 10 or 20 times. It might take two or three days or maybe two or three weeks. But if you'll stand firm, he will run away from you. And the, the wording there in the Greek literally is a word that I've read more than one commentator says the, the, the Greek picture is like an animal who's been whipped, whose tail is tucked between their legs as they're running away. That's the idea of the enemy fleeing from you. Not because I attacked him, but because I stood firm. He's not afraid of me. <laughs> That's not why he ran. Okay? But he doesn't like the word of God believed and spoken out through a child of God's mouth. And I don't speak it. I'm not, I mean, yeah, did Jesus speak it in reply to what the enemy said? Yes, he did. If the enemy brings up something to you, yes, you can use the word of God and counter it, yes. But I would, as much as possible, not engage him much in conversation. If the enemy suggests something in my mind, what I usually do is remind myself of what the scripture says and stand firm in it, right? I don't need to tell him. He knows the Bible better than I do. I just need to remind me of it right? And stand firm in what I have. What about 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5? It says, in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time if you humble yourself under his mighty hand by casting all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Be sober and alert, because your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. Resist him, therefore, strong in your faith, 
because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Nothing in there is attacking. All of it is resisting and standing strong in faith. Right? And the last word in that passage says, to God belongs the power forever. Not to Mark. To God belongs the power forever. Now, the one last mention I'm going to give you is in Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to admit to you, I have no idea what it's talking about. And when I read commentators, I'm not convinced that they have the first idea what they're talking about. But I'm just going to read it to you. Um, it says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeing rest, and finds none. The word dry places literally means that. It means, in fact, some translation says waterless. Why? I don't know. And I don't know anybody who does know. Okay? I don't think the devil is afraid of water. Uh, so, you know, otherwise I think God would probably tell us all to go live in the beach water. But no, uh, -uh. no, it, I, I don't, I, I don't know why, why, why dry? I have no idea. Now, some commentators try to tie this together with a passage in the book of Isaiah that talks about how um, that that um, that uh, because of the the sins of the nation that uh, that the the nation's going to be desolate and a place for jackals and and for um, vultures and for uh, night owls and stuff like that and they take one of those words that have to do with a, with um an, uh, an uh, like an ostrich or an owl and say it's actually talking about uh, demons it, that these abandoned cities um in the desert are a place for demons. Okay, well, maybe you're right. I don't know. That seems like a bit of a stretch to me, but sure, go ahead. That's fine. And in Jewish, the Jewish faith, dating back before the time of Jesus, they believed that demonic spirits would often live in abandoned towns and stuff like that. Well, maybe they do. What does that got to do with me? If it's an abandoned town, it means I'm not even there. So what do I care if they're living in, a, in an abandoned city? Who cares? Uh, uh, no. so, I mean, so maybe that's what Jesus is referring to. But notice that really that's got nothing to do with what he's saying. The issue is not where the demons go after they leave you. It's what you do after they leave. That's the issue. If you are not a born-again person, now for a born-again person, this doesn't even apply. Because he was not in me in the first place. I've only got one spirit in me, and that's the Holy One. Okay? I cannot be possessed by a demonic spirit. That is the world. The, the devil can only possess his own in the same way that God can only possess his own. Are you, are you seeing that? Okay. So I've got the Holy Spirit in me. So this whole thing I'm reading right here has got really nothing to do with spiritual warfare. I'm just throwing it in there for good measure. Okay. It just says, when an unclean spirit is driven out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and he finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came, meaning the man, right? And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. I meaning it's all cleaned up, ready for the next occupant, but there is no occupant. It's not been filled with the Spirit of God. It's empty. So what's he do? It says, then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than themselves, and they enter and dwell there, and the latter state of that man state of that man is worse than the first, so shall it be with this wicked generation. So this is also another reason why it's not wise to go trying to cast demonic spirits out of people that don't want the demonic spirit gone. Because the latter in that person is going to be worse than the first. Because if you successfully get that demon out of them and they don't let put Jesus in there, the Holy Spirit in there, then the latter on that person is going to be worse than if you did nothing. Hello? So we need to be led. Right? A person is going to have to want help. Right? Or they're just going to invite them back anyway and the latter on that person is going to be even worse. But what's that got to do with actual spiritual warfare in a child of God's life? Absolutely nothing. So, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. Now, that verse right there, if, can we say if, if it's referring to the dry places is talking about abandoned cities in a desert, then maybe you could claim that demonic spirits might possess places and things. But that would be the only reference in the entire Bible of it happening. Are you with me? Okay. 
Am I saying that demonic spirits cannot possess objects? I'm not saying that because I would be speaking out of my ignorance. I don't know. I know that in my own life, I have one example where I personally believe that's what happened. But my experience is not on par with scripture. Hello? Okay. When I was a young man, I used to have a little orange box. And it was it was a it was a box that used to hold this uh I don't know what it was like this hairy thing with this um big eyeballs and a nose on it uh, and a spring and you just uh, tied it to the ceiling it would just bounce it was just a funny face kind of thing and but the box was now empty because that little funny bouncy thing was someplace in the room um and I had stored stamps in it because uh, my dad had given me his stamp collection which dated back forever. And and some of the stamps had not been put in a book yet. And so all these loose stamps were in this box. And uh, one night, my room got stupid cold. I mean, like frost on the window kind of cold. And I felt very uneasy. And I'm born again. So I run in and I go get my mom. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm pretty sure there's a demon in my room. Um, I was about seven years old-ish. I know I wasn't even, I wasn't approaching 10 yet. Um, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't know what this is, but I think there's a demon in there. And so she comes in and she says, well, where is it? I said, I, it feels like it's coming from that box right there. And she said, well, then tell it to go. Okay, well, tell me what to say. So she told me what to say. Just, just don't, if there's a demonic spirit in here or attached to any of those stamps in that box, I command you to leave in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I did that. And the room returned to normal. I didn't feel anything anymore. And that was the end of it. That was the whole experience from beginning to end. Now, were there actually a demonic spirit in the stamps? I don't know. Maybe it was a demonic spirit just in the room, trying to scare me, trying to do whatever. I don't know. But it felt like it was coming from the box. Is Can I use that as a proof Positive that demons possess objects. No, I really can't. It's an example in my life, but I can't guarantee that he was that the if they if it even was a demonic spirit that it actually was in the box. It could have been on the roof for all I know. I'm just saying that's where I felt it was. Okay. Uh, the real takeaway is the name of Jesus made it go away, and I was fine. I went to sleep and never had another problem like that. Well, I had one other problem like that, but it had nothing to do with an object. Um, in my whole life. So, I don't know if. Because, you know, the, you, the word poltergeist, as done by Hollywood, means a million weird, stupid, goofy things. Poltergeist, in reality, what it would mean is a demonic spirit inhabiting an object. Okay? Like a house, like a haunted house. Or like, um, there's a lot of people who claim, and they may be right, I'm not poo-pooing this. You hear what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's not real. I'm saying you can't find a ba basis for it in Scripture. Okay, which means that if it is real, it doesn't matter because the same thing gets rid of it if it's in an in a object as it does if it was in a person. Okay, that's all that matters. I'm not saying the fact that it doesn't appear in scripture means it doesn't it doesn't happen. I'm not saying that. Does that mean I think I've said that enough? You get what I'm saying, right? All I am saying is that clearly it doesn't matter because if it did matter, a big deal you would think would be made of it in scripture. Do you see what I'm saying? That's that's my conclusion. Um. So there are people that believe that uh, that witches and stuff like that place curses on objects and that demonic spirits will inhabit objects, particularly that they do those things with older objects, like things that people will like to hold on to, things they don't want to get rid of, keepsakes. This was my grandmother's 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 and I want to keep it. Well, you know what? That would make sense for, you know, if you're going to have a demon that was going to inhabit an object, you would want it to be something people don't want to get rid of. That would make sense. So tactically, would that be a sound tactic? Sure it would be. Why not? Um, I, but the point is, I don't know whether it's even physically possible in a spiritual sense for a spirit to inhabit an inanimate object. I don't know if that's even possible. I don't know enough about the spirit realm to know that. I have no idea. I have no idea how they inhabit my, you know, a human body at all. There's already a spirit in there. It seems to me to get crowded. So I don't know. All I know is that uh, it, it might be possible. And so, therefore, and have I felt weird things, especially up in New England area, in some antique shops? Yes, I have. 
Um, but does that is that proof of anything? No, it really isn't. And so therefore I can't teach it as a solid fact. What I can say is that if the object is in my home, then I'm going to either deal with it or get rid of that dumb object. You see what I'm saying? Like with the stamps, I dealt with it, it left. I've never had another problem. I still have those stamps today. They've never heard, uh, for for 30, well, 40 some odd years, I've never heard a peep out of that box since. Okay? Not scared that I ever will. Right? Because they've been told to go by a power greater than them. Right? They have no desire to get back in that box. <laughs> They have no desire to get in my house because they know what I'll do if they show up. So probably not a good idea. But could it happen? I would say, yes, I believe it is possible. Okay. Now, attached to that question, particularly, I'm open this to everybody, but particularly to Vivian, it was, if there's more to that or a question behind that question, please feel free to ask me. And if I have an answer, I'll offer it. I may not have one, but does anybody have any question, particularly you first? Is there truly such a thing as an amp spirit? Uh, I'll say I don't know. Okay. I, I know that I know that I know that like Brother Hagen talked about what a spirit when he sometimes claims that he saw into the spirit realm and that there was um you know sometimes where he saw a person and there was like an imp like or or monkey kind of like spirit that was attached to them that was falling around everywhere or this guy that had lived with migraines for many many years and uh, couldn't seem to get rid of them and then he saw in the spirit and there was a a, a, a monkey like small creature wrapped around his head um so sure maybe that's true but even if it is it's just a demon um the the one thing we know that the bible does not go into great detail is if there's different kinds of demons or what they look like or anything. We do know that there are different hierarchies, just like there is on the good side, right? We got Mark, Michael the Archangel, which presumably is above your garden variety of angel, right? Okay, you, you've got seraphim and you got cherubim. And so we understand there's different things going on there. But the Bible has not gone out of its way to tell us much about it, which also tells me it must not be too terribly important, right? So that's what that's where I say, and I'm not making light. Please don't think I'm making light because I'm not. Um, it's any question like that's a good question. Um, but from my perspective, again, I think we learn as much about what we are to do and not to do by what the Bible does not say by what it does say. And if it's important, the Bible says something about it. If it doesn't, it must not be important. So it's possible that there are imp spirits. There's possible that there are are great big huge demonic spirits there might be some that attach themselves to people there might be clearly demonic spirits can express themselves in illnesses and stuff like that because we saw that in jesus ministry right healing all who were oppressed of the devil right remember that one woman who had been bent over for 17 or 18 years and Jesus set her free on the Sabbath. And when he was uh, confronted about it, he said, should not this woman who is a daughter of Abraham, who the devil has had bent over for these 18 years, think about it. All those words Jesus said, he even said the words, think about it. Should she not be made free on the Sabbath? So are there demonic spirits that are manifest? The way they manifest themselves is through sickness and disease. Absolutely. We know that. What they look like, I don't know. So go on with any further question attached to that. That's fine. Well, y'all don't think I'm crazy, but I had a gallon of, I forget if it's kills or bullseye or whatever, mm -hmm. and it tilted over. Mm -hmm. Lid was still on it. I picked it up. I looked. Nothing was spilled. Nothing was anywhere. Uh-huh, yeah. So I just took it and laid it to the side. Mm -hmm. Two, three days later, I go in my bedroom and it splattered all over my dresser drawer, uh -huh. clothes, but yet the lid was still on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it's possible that a demonic spirit could do something like that. Um, but I can tell you any activity of an enemy is all to get you to put faith in them and out of God. So if it doesn't have that end result, it's meaningless, right? I'm not saying that the enemy is meaningless. I'm saying that his tactics, his end game is to get our faith out of God's word, what he has said to us. 
Uh, and we see that in Jesus by the very fact that the thing he relied upon when the enemy came against him was the word of God, right? And we see in his parable of the sower and the seed that it was the word of God was the pivotal thing. What, how they dealt with the heart, the word of God is what made them a heart number one, heart number two, heart number three, or heart number four. Word of God, word of God, word of God. So clearly that's the important thing, and he's trying to draw us off of that. And it's our faith in the word of God and in the son of God that causes us to overcome the world. So whatever the enemy's doing, that's what he's trying to do is get your faith off of that, right? So if it doesn't have that result, then he loses, right? So my advice would be if that's still there in your house, either, you know, even if it's not real, if even if this is just some weird whatever, just deal with it and just tell, say, if there's any demonic spirit in this house, I'm telling you, you don't have jurisdiction here. I'm a daughter of God. I've been bought in blood with, uh, paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I've opened any door to you, I've asked the Holy Spirit to reveal it to me. And I'm going to be shutting that door as quick as I find out what it is. But in the meantime, I'm telling you, leave these premises. This is my home. That does not mean he has to leave as in he doesn't he not have a right to tempt you there. Okay. It just means he doesn't have any jurisdiction there. You see what I'm saying? And then leave it at that. Okay? And I, no, I don't think you're crazy. And I don't think there's any reason to feel one way or the other. Because the enemy will do all kinds of weird things. Okay? But I know what his goal is. And if he can't achieve the, uh, the, the goal one way, he'll come at it another way. Okay? But that's the only thing he's looking for. So we just don't give it to him. Amen? Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Well, I... I... I mean, I don't know for sure, but um, I don't know how much you know about the situation in Virginia where I was stopped. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when I seen that, it put that fear yeah. that I was being stalked again by this. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Well, that would make sense. Then if this was a demonic thing, it was there to get you into fear. Because now fear is not. I know that in the Word of Faith movement, we try to say that fear is. The opposite of faith. It is not. But where fear is, you cannot have faith. Okay? What fa fear is, is evil hope. Okay? It's an expectation of something bad. Hope is what builds up or has a firm foundation underneath your faith in God. Right? So if the enemy can replace my hope with fear, then it makes my faith not supported by anything. Okay? But it's not a substitute for faith. It just gets rid of the hope that's attached to faith. Faith is the firm foundation. I mean, the hope is the firm foundation underneath my faith. And if I remove that, my faith is standing on nothing, right? So if he can get you in fear, he's challenged the very foundation of your faith. So don't let him do that, right? Does anybody have any other thoughts or questions about this topic? Does it make sense to you? Okay. I, 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 and again, as I stress to you, and so a couple of you were out, were out of the room at the time that I stressed this part, so you missed it, but I'm not in any way, and I said it towards the beginning, I'm not in any way trying to play down the role of the enemy or, that, or his potential to be a threat. I'm not saying that. But the one thing we see recurring throughout Scripture is he's only a real threat to those who give ear to him. Okay, not even to people who are not born again, to the lost. Now, he's going to get a lot of inroads with them because they're easy targets. All right. They want to give in to him. Jesus said about the Pharisees, he says, he said, you're a father. He said, you're of your father, the devil and the desires of your father. You want to do right. So, I mean, that's the way the children of this world are. But that doesn't mean that the devil can just run roughshod over them. Right? I mean, remember with Peter, what did it say? The devil asked for you. He didn't just come up and take you. Right? What with Job? Right? The devil didn't just come in and do something. He went to God. Right? There's only one sovereign in the universe, and that's God. It is not the devil. And like I said, if, there, if the devil had supreme authority, he could keep you from getting born again. And there isn't a person who has ever been so lost that they were able to be kept from believing in and confessing the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, he, the enemy's been stripped of his power. That does not mean we do not give him power and give him our authority. Yes, we can. 
And can he wreak all kinds of havoc? Yes, he can. He is a powerful foe. There's no question about that. We don't make light of him. We don't play him down. We don't act like we're bigger and better than he is. Because technically, in and of ourselves, he could walk over us like we were nothing. Okay? But we're not by ourselves. So it's very, very important that we understand that and that all of our spiritual warfare is about us and are connected to our Father, not us attacking the enemy. The, the, the closest we get to attacking the enemy is furthering the kingdom of God by spreading the gospel and living it. And occasionally, if you ever run to an opportunity where a person needs to be delivered from a demonic spirit, if you cast out a demonic spirit, that's the closest we ever get to attacking the enemy. Hello? That's it. So, um, at the end of this message on the website, I'm going to have links to the four or five major messages where issues about this kind of stuff was mentioned. So that in one place, you've got links that will take you to everything we've ever talked about with this, primarily. Okay? Um, included in that is also the article on Biting and Loosing, which you can find on your own easy enough. Just go to the very top tab where it has articles, click on it, it'll give you a list of all the articles. You just read them, you'll find the one on Biting and Loosening right there. Okay? But I'll also include it as a link attached to this particular post on the website so it's easy to find. Okay? And that way you'll have literally everything of any real note that has been said about the topic of spiritual warfare in this church. Okay? Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.